having a sound system. And that one, the only thing I know, Paul may have been that battery low on that microphone there, that it wasn't always connected. All right, we're going to get back in with 1 Timothy chapter 1. If you'll turn there, please. <clears throat> First Timothy chapter 1. The story is told of an English village whose church had an arch. Written on the arch was the words, We preach Christ crucified. Wonderful message. For years, godly men preached and presented the crucified Savior as the only means of salvation. But as time passed and those godly men passed, Others preached to consider the cross and its message antiquated, even repulsive. So they began to preach Christ's example and teachings only. The ivy on the arch grew and covered the word crucified. Now you can only read, we preach Christ. Uh, then the church decided that its uh, message need not even be confined to Christ and the Bible. The eyes did continue to grow, and you could only read the words, we preach. What a sad commentary for a church. Um, but it is a present danger for any church. From the very beginning in the first century, the Apostle Paul addressed to here, to this young man, Timothy, at Ephesus, the church that he had been left at to be the elder, pastor, bishop of that church. And the first thing the Apostle Paul, once he had left him there and went into uh, the next area, he wrote back, and the first thing that he warns him about is false teaching, false teachers. The danger of false teachers was something that was heavy upon the mind of the Apostle Paul. Matter of fact, uh, over in Acts chapter 20, we read how that uh, the Apostle, well, Steve read this for us, the Apostle Paul um, gathered the elders from the church of Ephesus. Now it was not just young Timothy, but they had other pastors that were there. And he began to, preach, to uh, talk to them and warn them. And he says in verse 29, For I know this, that after my departing shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. Also of your own selves shall men arise, speaking perverse things, to draw away disciples after them. Therefore, watch, be alert. Remember that by the space of three years I cease not to warn everyone night and day with tears. Paul had it on his mind, and it wasn't just a one-time warning, but for three years, he said, constantly I reminded you of the possibility that there is going to be some people that will come into the church and try to teach something different than what we've been teaching you, especially about the gospel. There will be even some people that will rise up from in the church and try to teach different things. My question this morning is, is it possible that false teachers could teach incorrect doctrine here at Holly Hills Baptist Church, either presently or in the future? Is that a possibility? We can have the same type of testimony how that uh, this church that had that sign had godly men that taught the truth and preached the truth of God's word. But as they passed off of the scene, things changed. And if the Lord Jesus Christ does not come back in the rapture anytime soon, there's coming a day that I'm not going to be the pastor of this church anymore. There will be another man standing here. A man of your choice. Because it will be the church's responsibility to vote on that pastor that will come in. A man that you feel that is qualified. A man that you feel that God has called for that purpose to come here and to stand. 
And there will be teachers that are no longer teachers in our church, whether in Sunday school or in youth ministry. There will be other volunteers that have come in and taking those positions and are using them. And could it be that there will be some of them that have an agenda that are teaching primarily their opinions about what the Word of God is than actually really studying and digging and finding out what does God's Word say. We have to be careful. I believe that we have good godly teachers today. And I, as a pastor, is trying to take the Word of God and preach it and compare Scripture with Scripture and give the support of the things that I say because my opinions do not matter. God's opinion is the only thing that does. And He has communicated that in His Word. So the same warning that Paul gave to young Timothy and to the other pastors there at Ephesus is the same warning that I want us to get today that we must constantly guard against false teaching and false teachers that could creep into our church or be raised up into a position that were already in our church that may begin to teach the Word of God by their opinions instead of by really digging and working to understand the truth of it. It's easy to take God's Word and say, I'm just going to read it down through here and I'm going to tell you what I think it says. Okay? I would not have had to study to do that. I could get up here and read it and tell you what I think it says. But I spend hours every week making sure that it's not just what I think, but it is supported through Scripture. It is supported through the opinions of other good godly men that we agree that that's what the Apostle Paul was originally communicating to the people that he wrote to and that's what the language bears fruit of and that we are communicating that truth correctly. If we do not put forth the effort, whether a Sunday school teacher, a youth group teacher, or as a pastor, if we don't put forth the effort to make sure, then all we're doing is standing up and telling people our opinions about what God's Word says. That's dangerous. We can be misled. We can misunderstand ourselves. And we've got to be careful. So the warning he gives is for us. Is it possible that that could happen to us? I've entitled the message today, The Danger of False Teachers. Father, I pray that as we look into your word this morning, that you would help me to very clearly be able to share what you've laid upon my heart, what your word bears uh, through for us, that we would understand not just what it says, but Lord, the warning to us that we would prepare ourselves to have it in mind that we must be diligent, both uh, in our teaching, whether it be in a, a uh, position officially, or whether it be unofficially as a mom or dad in our home, Whatever the case may be, may we do it, Lord, diligently to handle your word properly and then, Lord, to respond to your word appropriately. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I want us to look first at verses 3 and 4 as we picked up last week in this series of 1 Timothy. And uh, we see that Paul is writing to this young man, maybe 30 to 35 years of age. It was about my age when I first came here to Holly Hills, to turn 35, I think, right after I became pastor. And, um, and I've been here, I don't know, let's don't do the math, okay? Uh, but anyway, we're remembering here what, what Paul is talk, talking about. Verse 3 and 4, he says, As I uh, besought thee to abide still at Ephesus when I went to Macedonia, that thou mightest charge some that they teach no other doctrine, neither give heed to fables and endless genealogies, which minister questions rather than godly edifying, which is in faith, so do. Godly edifying, which is in faith, so do. That's what we're after. The edifying, the building up, the benefiting spiritually. Uh, these false teachers uh, and false teaching does not do that. So he says there, I want, uh, I want you to remember why I left you in Ephesus. 
I left you in there to charge some. The word charge means to give short, strict orders or commands, and some implies there were a few. They were not necessarily a lot of false teachers, but they were still influential uh, in the church. And what were the orders or the commands that he said? That they teach no other doctrine. Doctrine means teachings. No other teachings other than what the apostles had been teaching to the churches. That's what they were to obey. That's what they were to follow. The epistles that Paul was writing went to churches, but then they would send them and they would pass them to other churches that they could benefit. From those epistles, they would find uh, the teachings, the doctrine, and what should be followed and, and taught and, and, uh, and obeyed. Uh, no other doctrine, no different than what the apostles had taught. The words doctrine, teach, teacher, and teachings occur 32 times in the pastoral epistles of 1st and 2nd Timothy and Titus. 32 times. Do you think that's an emphasis of what God has on the teachings, the doctrine? He makes a great emphasis of that. One of the greatest responsibilities of the church is to teach doctrine. One of the greatest responsibilities of a pastor, I believe, seen in Acts chapter 6, that they chose out, I believe, the first deacons so that the pastor could give himself unto the word and to prayer. That was the emphasis. And as a pastor, that's what I want to have as an emphasis before our church. And I've sought to do that over these 30 years, and I want to continue to do that. And I want that to be your heart as well as our theme there. Teach me thy way, O Lord. We want to know God's word, God's way, so that we can follow it. We can obey it. What were they teaching? They were teaching fables, legends, fanciful stories manufactured by men. There are some churches today, I've heard from your own testimony, how that you have visited somewhere when you were away, maybe visiting with relatives or on vacation, and you come back and say, Pastor, I did not even need a Bible. They never referenced the Word of God. He just got up and he told some wonderful stories and, and made people feel good, and that's about all that was, was shared. Unfortunately, there are too many churches that have that as a testimony. They may have a good speaker. He may be pleasant to listen to. But whether or not the people are being fed the truth of the Word of God is in question. We're not to be that way. We're not to be involved in those kind of fables or genealogies. I'm not sure what it's speaking about here. Uh, genealogies are in Scripture. They are beneficial, but we certainly don't spend a lot of time just going through and dealing with gene genealogies. But it says there that we're raising more questions than they were answering them. And as I said before, uh, if you don't know, how can you do? And so it is important for us not to just have questions about things, but we're to learn the answers to those things so that we can be edified, we can be built up, we can be benefited spiritually in our life and in our spiritual growth. Um, the error of the false teachings was that particular type of, of uh, testing. And we have then the goal of the false teachers. What were they after? In verse 5, now the end of the commandment is love, he says. This is good. Out of a pure heart and of good conscience and of faith, unfeigned, unfeigned, unfeigned faith is genuine faith. From which some having swerved, deviated, have turned aside unto vain jangling. Now let's look here. Paul, first of all, contrasts the end of, of the goal of good doctrine, good teaching, to that of the, the false teachers. The goal of the good commands that he had given um, is that, that sound doctrine produces love. Sound doctrine, the goal of sound doctrine is love. Now why is love important? Because all you need is love, right? No. Because Jesus answered a question when he was asked, what is the first and greatest commandment? And he said, thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy mind. 
And the second commandment is like unto it, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments hang all the law of the prophets. Love is the fulfillment of the law. Love is the fulfillment of everything else God has said for us to do. And so if we have love, if we have proper love, we're headed in the right direction as far as obeying God. The goal of sound doctrine is love. Love also is the mark of the true Christian. Jesus said in John 13, 35, By this shall all men know that you are my disciples if you have love one for another. Love is what we need is the goal of sound doctrine. This kind of love flows from three sources, he said. First of all, it flows from a pure heart. What is a pure heart? Well, I think uh, King David uh, is an illustration of that. You remember after his sin with Bathsheba, he finally uh, broke down in confession unto the Lord with his sin in Psalm 5110. He cried, says, create uh, in me a clean heart, O God. Create in me a, a clean heart, a pure heart, one that has been cleansed uh, by regeneration initially, that's salvation, and one that has been cleansed by confession. Every one of us in here today have that responsibility. We have a choice to make initially. I pray that every one of you have already trusted the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior. You have been regenerated. You've been given new life through the new birth. And you have that, and God positionally has cleansed you and given you the righteousness of Jesus Christ. But as a Christian, we can still sin because we still have this sinful nature that's within us that fights with our new nature. And when it wins and we fall in sin, then we have the responsibility to repent from that sin and to confess that sin unto the Lord. And He is faithful and just to forgive us. Isn't that wonderful? Cleansing our heart. We have a regenerated heart, but then we have a cleansed heart through confession like King David did. A pure heart. <clears throat> Not only is the goal of sound doctrine a pure heart, but it is also of a good conscience, it said. <clears throat> a conscience is divine as a God-created, self-judging faculty of man that either affirms or accuses us. You know how your conscience works. Uh, your conscience talks to you when you've done something and, and your conscience you starts making you feel bad. So I, I probably shouldn't have said that. Uh, I don't think that was a good choice I made. Or maybe we, we make a, a choice and, and our conscience doesn't bother us. And we assume that, hey, you know, that must have been an okay thing that I did. Now, here's the problem with a conscience. It sometimes can give us wrong information. Uh, we have in Scripture this possible Titus 1.15. Uh, it calls it a defiled conscience. A defiled conscience is one that's giving the wrong information, and therefore it misleads us. We can have a conscience that can mislead us. We can also have, according to 1 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 2, it says, speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron, we can have a seared conscience, it's a conscience that gives no information. It's, uh, it's insensitive to either right or wrong. It's not helping you in any, any way. It's possible for that to happen. But we want to guard against that so that we would have a good conscience. A good conscience is one that is working properly. Paul's desire was uh, said and stated in Acts chapter 24, verse 16, Herein do I exercise myself to have always a conscience void of offense toward God and toward men. I want to have a clear conscience when it comes to my living before God and my living and dealing with others. I don't want to have a conscience that's bothering me. I want to live in such a way that I have a clear conscience. Does your conscience work properly? Is it void of offense? Or is it even with your conscience? God has used it to speak to you. 
Not only a pure heart and a good conscience, but that uh, sound doctrine that produces love uh, comes from faith unfeigned, a genuine faith. Timothy had, that, Timothy had that kind of faith, 2 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 5. He says, I know the, the unfeigned faith that is in thee, which was in thy grandmother Lois, and in thy mother Eunice, and I'm convinced it's in you also. Uh, I know that Timothy had a genuine faith according to the Apostle Paul's testimony. But note three things about genuine faith. Genuine faith, according to James chapter 2, will always be accompanied by good works. Now, we are not saved in any way by doing good works. But when we have genuine faith, it will always be followed by good works. James asked the question, you have faith, I have works. You show me your faith without your works. I'll show you my faith by my works. And you see, when God saves us, he saves us not on the merit of anything good that we have ever done. For all of my righteousnesses are as filthy rags, we're told. And that we're not saved by any righteous work that we can do. It's by God's mercy, His grace that He saves us. And so when He saves us, then we're saved unto the good works. He never saves a person just to sit and do nothing. It's always for the purpose. We are His workmanship. Created in Christ Jesus unto good works. That comes directly, verse 10 of, of Ephesians 2, after verses 8 and 9, says, Not by works that we have done, but by God's grace. We're saved by grace through faith, not of any kind of works we can do. And so God makes it clear that uh, genuine faith is accompanied by works. Secondly, genuine faith produces fruit. You remember Jesus' words in Matthew chapter 7, where he spoke there and says, By their fruit you shall know them. And he went on to say that there's going to be some that's going to say that they're saved, but by their works they're going to kind of deny that. And he gives an example, and he says, or illustration, he says that the wise man built his house upon the, the rock and the, and the foolish man built his house upon the sand. And the whole point of the story was not teaching us how to build our physical houses. But he says there, he that heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them, I will liken him unto the wise man that built his house upon the rock. He that hears these sayings of mine and obeys them is the fruit that you shall know him by, is what he was saying. And so genuine faith will produce fruit, and that fruit is the obedience of us following God's word. And then genuine faith, thirdly, grows by trusting God in little things. I have uh, used this illustration before. My kids growing up, your kids, I'm sure, are probably the same. Uh, when my kids were growing up, I'd get them on a picnic table and say, hey, jump to daddy. And, of course, my little, you know, boys and so forth, they would jump. Lisa would jump. And, um, and then as it, you know, got the opportunity to a little high or something, hey, jump to daddy. Yeah. And then when the frisbee got stuck up on the garage, uh, they got them up there. And then when it's time to get down, I said, now, jump to daddy. I'm not drunk you. I won't drunk you. Now, if I'd have started out off, off the roof of the garage, it would have been a really scary thing. But when they have learned that you will not drop them, the next step is the easy step. And the same thing when we come to trusting God's faithfulness. When we see the little things of God, how He is faithful, then the next step is not so big a step. We have grown that faith, that genuine faith, grows by trusting God in the little things. Do you have genuine faith? Do you have growing faith with the Lord? Those false teachers in verse 6 said that they swerved. <laughs> and they deviated. They missed the mark. They didn't get their doctrine straight. And because they didn't get their doctrine straight, they turned aside. 
Misunderstanding doctrine causes wrong choices. When you got your doctrine mixed up, you're going to make the wrong choices in life. So many illustrations of that in Scripture. We have to make sure that we do not swerve, we do not turn aside from sound doctrine. Under vain jangling, it said, they're empty teaching that produces nothing. On the other hand, the Apostle Paul praised those in uh, Thessalonians um, for their response to the Word of God and sound teaching. Listen to this in 1 Thessalonians 2, verse 13. For this cause also thank we God without ceasing, because when you received the Word of God which you heard of us, when you heard us teaching this Word of God, you received it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth the word of God, which effectually worketh also in you that believe. The word effectually there is the word energio. It is the word that means powerfully. God powerfully worked in them because they received the sound teaching, not just from man, but they received it as it was from God. And my teaching that I give you here is not just, as I said, an opinion of a man, but it's God's Word. It's, it's founded in God's Word. And so it is that that we are to receive it as, not the opinions of a pastor, but the direction, the Word of God. We are to believe it and let it have a powerful work in our lives as well. These false teachers had impure hearts. They were dull, possibly had seared consciences, and they had false faith. That will never, that will never produce godly love. That should be the goal, the ultimate goal uh, of sound doctrine. Now, verse 7 gives their motives. The motives of these false teachings. Desiring to be teachers of the law, understanding neither what they say nor whereof they affirm. These men desired in some way uh, to be connected there with teaching about uh, uh, the law. But notice the word desire. Here is the worst part. They had a desire that was an improper desire. They had a desire, I believe, to be seen in a position for prestige. I'm a pastor. I'm a Sunday school teacher. I'm a deacon. I'm a... They wanted a position to be seen. That's dangerous in the church. None of us should ever see and desire a position for in our mind, some kind of prestige that is connected to it. That is not the reason that we serve. It was similar to that of the Pharisees recorded in Matthew 23, verses 5 through 7. But all their works they do for to be seen of men. They love the uttermost rooms at feasts and the chief seats in the synagogues and greetings in the markets and to be called of, of men, Rabbi, Rabbi, or teacher. To be called teacher, teacher. That's what or made them do a good to have that position. They desired it improperly, first of all. And they taught here concerning the law. It indicates that these false teachers had something to say about the law. We don't know exactly what it was, but we have to, to assume by the context here that it was skewing the, the genuineness of the gospel of Jesus Christ, especially false teachers and false teaching today. One of the number one things that they do is they confuse the sound doctrine by infusing works into salvation. Most all false teachers and false teaching, most all, if not all, false religion has some kind of works built in to their doctrine. That you've got to do something. I've said many times that, that, that if the Bible had said if you dig a ditch one foot wide and two feet deep for one mile, you get to go to heaven, 
that our earth would be covered with trenches. Because people are willing to do some work. But to tell them it's not by works, but by faith in the finished work of Jesus Christ. That's not tangible in their imagination to do anything. But that's what faith is. It's putting our confidence in something that we may not be able to see, but we have the evidence of truth of God's word that tells us, and we believe it. They were misusing the law. They not only were unprepared in the knowledge about the law, they were ignorant of the law, but their teaching, uh, they were teaching the law in their own opinions, as I warned earlier. That's a dangerous thing for us to give our opinions because we can mislead others. God speaks to us as teachers and says he has a high standard for us, and there is going to be a more severe judgment by him for us. And it's going to include, if we do it correctly, a great reward. But there's going to be some judgment in the not so good area if we do it improperly. If we are misleading others, we have to be careful how we use the word of God. Prestige has led many Christians down the wrong path and has hurt others. Is there any position in this church that you have desired for the wrong reason? <laughs> Next, in verse 8, especially in, down through verse 11, we see the effect of the false teachers. In verse 8, it says, For we know that the law is good, Paul says very quickly, and he's been talking about the law, and they've been teaching the law, and been in an incorrect way, but he's very quick to say, we know that the law is good if a man use it lawfully or properly, <clears throat> knowing this, that the law is not made for a righteous man, but the, for the lawless and disobedient, for the ungodly and for sinners, for unholy and profane, for murderers of fathers and murderers of mothers, and for manslayers, for whoremongers, for them that defile themselves with mankind, for men stealers and, and liars and perjured persons. And if there be any other thing that is contrary to sound doctrine, you can throw that in there as well, he's saying, according to the glorious gospel of the blessed God, which was committed to my trust. The effect of false teachers. Paul, very quickly, lest anyone thought that he was just saying bad things about the law itself, says that the law is good if it's used properly. We'll get to that in just a moment. But notice that Paul illustrated the type of people for whom the law was given. He says the law was not given for a righteous man. How many righteous men do we have in here? I hope if anybody raised their hand, you're talking about position. <laughs> you know that uh, there is none righteous, no, not one. There's none good. All of us have sinned. We understand that. I hope you understand that. But for those that are saved, for those that have, that have received the remedy, the law is not given to me anymore to, for the purpose that the law was given. I'll put it that way. We are to learn from it, and, and it certainly guides us. Well, I'll get to that in just a moment. But Paul gave the first six sins that he said here, these type of people that uh, it illustrated that the law was made for, the first six sins are three couplets containing the root sin and then the effect of that sin, what it produces. For instance, there is the lawless, which are also disobedient, rebellious. There is the ungodly of those sinners with no regard to God's way. There is the unholy, which means indifferent to what's uh, uh, right, and the profane, profane, those that trample on what is sacred. Then the rest of what Paul gives there parallels the second half of the Ten Commandments, the half of the Ten Commandments that deals with our relationship with one another. He says there are murderers of fathers and of mothers there. The fifth commandment, we're to honor our father and mother. 
manslayers, sixth commandment, don't kill. Uh, whoremongers, uh, the, the word actually is the word pornos. We get the word pornography. Uh, fornicator is what it means. And connected there with defile themselves with mankind. Literally, the translation of that defile themselves with mankind is males in the marriage bed. Now, you can't get any clearer than that. Homosexuality. Homosexuality, fornication, uh, all of that together, the seventh commandment, there should be no adultery. Any type of sex outside of marriage, God forbids. And by the way, God designed marriage and God designed one man and one woman uh, to be together in marriage. Is that correct? That is what God said and it was from the beginning and we have to understand it and that's why we believe it that way. Um, are we being insensitive to the, to the world around us and our society? No, we're being genuine in our faith where God says, this is where I draw the line, this is what it's for, and it was a reason. And so we have in Scripture our bounds, and that's where we stand. We love them, and we want to give the truth to them, but that is not an alternate lifestyle that God would condone we need to recognize that. <clears throat> so we have there uh, those that are in, in adultery, no adultery, no fornication, no uh, homosexuality, or anything else in that category. Men stealers, uh, eighth commandment, no stealing. Liars or perjured persons, ninth commandment, no false witness. And then to make sure you had everything covered, you said anything else against sound doctrine. Uh, it comes under this category there. The law was given for those people, the law was given for a purpose. What was the purpose of the law? The law was given to show sinners, first of all, to show them their sin. We're told in Romans 3, verses 19 and 20, where he says that the law was given so that we would become guilty before God. It is by the law is the knowledge of sin. Paul had said if it wasn't for the law saying thou shalt not covet, I would not know that coveting was a sin. The law has outlined what, is, what sin is. And it is by the law that I see my guilt. And I become guilty before God. His holy standard I have come short of. And all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Romans 3.23. And so we recognize as a sinner our guilt before God because the law tells us what our sin is, where we miss the mark. Not only is the purpose of the law to show sinners their sin, but their purpose is to show sinners their need for a Savior. In Galatians chapter 3 and verse 24, it tells us that that the law was a schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ. You see, there's not just the law telling us that we are sinners, that we're under God's judgment, the wages of sin is death, but the law also points the finger to the remedy, which is the Lord Jesus Christ, the schoolmaster to bring us to Christ. Understand that the law without the gospel is like a diagnosis without a remedy. It tells you that you're only a sinner. You missed the mark. You're on your way to hell. But it gives you no hope. That's the law without the gospel. But also understand that the gospel without the law is only the good news of salvation for people who don't know any reason that they need it. If it isn't for the law to show us that we have missed the mark, then why do I need a remedy of Jesus Christ? And that's why where a lot of people are in our world today. When they hear the gospel of Jesus Christ, they hear that you need Jesus, you need to trust Jesus as your Savior. And inside they're asking themselves the question, why? I seem to be doing fine. They don't realize that they're already condemned 
to hell. And that their life, while relatively they may be good people compared to others in this world, compared to God and His holy standard, they have missed the mark. We need both the understanding of our sin and the understanding of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the remedy before salvation. Light will come on and say, hey, I need to choose Christ. That is what we need in sound doctrine through the gospel especially teaches that. Its purpose as we read up in verse 4, at the end of verse 4, is godly edifying. Godly edifying. Sound doctrine. To edify means to build up. To benefit spiritually. Teaching that produces spiritual life, salvation. Teaching that produces spiritual growth to maturity. Christ likeness. That's what sound doctrine does. Paul warns against the false teachers. He warns us against false teaching. He says, don't let that creep in from outside. Don't let that creep in from inside. Be aware. Be on guard. And keep godly men and women that are teaching the Word of God before our people so that we can have the truth of God's sound doctrine that produces Christ's likeness in those that have been saved. I want you to bow your heads with me just for a moment. You've heard the message. I pray that you've listened carefully. Have you obeyed the gospel of Jesus Christ yourself? Has there been a time in your life where you come to the understanding that you were a sinner? That you had missed the mark? That it was because of your sin that God says you were condemned to hell? And had you at that point made a choice to receive Jesus Christ as your Savior? I'm not asking if you believe in God. I'm not asking if you've been baptized or a church member. But have you made a choice personally to receive Jesus Christ as your Savior? That is the most important question you could ever answer. It's the most important thing you could ever do. For it is your spiritual birth. How many of you today, if you're present, could say to me, Pastor, I, to the best of my knowledge, genuinely have made a choice to receive Jesus Christ as my Savior. I have already done that. Can I see your hand, please? Thank you. All the way out of the room. Can I even put them back down? Is anybody here to say, Pastor, and I'm not going to point you out, but you say, Pastor Randy, I don't think I've done that or I know I haven't done that. Would you pray for me? I'm not going to mention your name, but I will pray for you. Anyone at all would say, Pastor, would you pray for me? I'm not sure if I trusted the Lord Jesus Christ as my Savior. For those of you that have trusted Christ as Savior, are you growing in Christ's likeness? Salvation is not the end of the journey. As long as the Lord allows you to live on this earth after you're saved, He wants you to be growing continually in the word of His grace. He wants you to continue to make those strides. In every church service, every Sunday school lesson, every uh, adult Bible study, every time you read God's word on your own, every time God's word comes into your life, God, through the Holy Spirit, wants to do that work in you and tune your heart more precisely like the Lord Jesus Christ. Are you growing? And then teachers, 
whether you're formally a teacher in our church or whether you are informally teaching your children at home or your grandchildren, are you handling the Word of God responsibly? Are you a teacher that takes the time to make sure that what you are communicating is not just your opinion, but it's founded in God's Word. Father, I pray for each one of us today that we may make sure that we are sharing and communicating the truth of your Word in such a way that you would be pleased and that people could be benefited. Thank you, Lord, for the good teachers that you have given us. And thank you for a church, Lord, that seems to love you and want to serve you. And I pray that we would never be satisfied with our status quo, but realizing, Lord, you always have room for us to grow closer. Draw us closer, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to close the service by singing together. Uh, don't have it in front of me here. Next slide, please. <clears throat> the Savior's waiting. Let's stand together as we sing it. Sing it prayerfully. If you need to speak to me about a decision, uh, you can come and, and uh, meet with me here. But let's sing it together on the first verse, please. <clears throat>